Hello, it's Peter Bradshaw from The Guardian and welcome to this film review channel to which I hope you will subscribe and leave a comment. A single satanic joke burns through the celluloid in Jonathan Glazer's technically brilliant, uneasy Holocaust movie, The Zone of Interest, freely adapted by the director from the novel by Martin Amis, a film which has rightly earned rapturous and awestruck reviews for its artistry and seriousness, but about which I am very marginally agnostic, though of course I can marvel at its sinister glaze and sheen. How did the placidly respectable home life of the German people coexist with imagining and executing the horrors of the genocide? How did such evil flower within what George Steiner called the German world of Silent Night, Holy Night, Gemütlichkeit. The film imagines the pure bucolic bliss experienced by Auschwitz camp commandant Rudolf Huss, played by Christian Friedel, who with his family lives in a handsomely appointed family home with servants just outside the barbed wire topped wall. His wife Hedwig, superbly played by Sandra Hüller, is thrilled with its idyllic paradise garden. She revels smugly in her unofficial title, Queen of Auschwitz, and with just that line alone, the zone of interest has probably earned enough nausea for a thousand films. Yeah, the Azaleen da. Here gibt's auch Gemüse. Bisschen Kräuter, auch Rosmarin. Here's rote Beete. Das ist Fenchel. Die Sonnenblumen hier. Und hier ist der Kohlrabi. Die Kinder essen wahnsinnig viel Kohlrabi. Die herrliche Zeit, die mir gemütlich gastlichen Hause Haus verlebten, wird immer mit zu unseren schönsten Urlaubsländern herumgehören. Im Osten steht unser Morgen. Welchen Dank für eure nationalsozialistische Gastfreundschaft. The Husses love to go fishing and bathing in the beautiful lakes and streams of the Polish countryside thereabouts. Although at one stage Hurst discovers what appears to be bone fragments and dark particulate matter in the river that has washed downstream from the camp and curtly orders his children out of the water and back to their lovely home for a wash. But really they live in complete denial in an enclosed world. Family life continues in all its unimaginable dysfunction. Scene follows scene in unbearable, effectless detachment with the children being attended to, the servants instructed the Nazi wives gossiped with. They chat about a nice dress salvaged from some little Jewess. Hedwig's mother is welcomed into the house and all the time screams and shouts and gunshots are faintly audible from over the wall. They are used to it. Perhaps the most stunning shot created by Glazer and his cinematographer Wukash Zal is the pin-sharp, deep focus view from the hearse's charming front garden down the path to the camp wall, behind which the chimney is visible against a vivid, hallucinatory blue sky. Hearst likes to tour the horrendous compound on horseback. It really has the scalp prickling quality of a bad dream or a fairy tale. But the horror of what is happening begins to surface in aberrant behaviour. A child sleepwalks and Hedwig's mother is more disturbed by this menage than she will admit. Troubled by the memory of once having worked for a Jewish woman that Hedwig briskly agrees may indeed be in the camp a few hundred metres from where they are talking in the beautiful garden. Their grotesque family life comes to an end when Hurst is ordered back to Berlin as a deputy inspector of the camps. But Hedwig demands to be allowed to stay behind with the children in the commandant's quarters because this is, after all, the best place to raise the children. The film with its superb score by Mika Levy and sound design by Johnny Byrne has undoubted power but might well revive the debate about conjuring slick movie effects and Bunuelian drollery from the horrors of history. I found myself thinking of Jacques Rivette's objection to the barbed wire tracking shot in Gilo Pontecorvo's Capo. Glazer's movie is, however, at least arguably, in the tradition of representing this horror indirectly, like Claude Lanzmann and Michael Haneke. And the film does try to accommodate Jewish testimony, though the final coda sequence in the modern-day Auschwitz Museum may absolve the film of flippancy, but it does oddly represent a kind of loss of nerve, as if the movie finally can't bear to stay within the prison of historical irony and has to flash forward out of there to restate its humane credentials. Yet there can be no doubt of Glazer's focus on an evil which creates its own banality, the banality which allowed the mass murderers to go about their business. That's all for now. Please give this vlog a like and a share and please subscribe telling me what you thought about the film. Please buy my book, The Films That Made Me, an edited selection of my essays and reviews for The Guardian. And also please give a listen to the podcast I'm doing with the film writer Amelia Rolovich. 
a matter of life and film. See you next time.